Welcome to Music Crush, a new music podcast hosted by Flute New Music Consortium. I'm Elizabeth Robinson. And I'm Nicole Reiner. If you like the show, please rate and review it on the platforms wherever you listen to podcasts, particularly on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find us and grow the show. And of course, you can learn more about Flute New Music Consortium at flutenewmusicconsortium.com. Christine Erlander Beard enjoys an active international career as a soloist, chamber artist, and teacher. She not only has a beautiful tone and phrasing, but the capacity to reveal the deep soul of a composition, says Martin Rokich. Passionate about collaborating with composers, Christy has commissioned and or premiered dozens of new works from composers across the globe. Her newest endeavor is to encourage music with social justice themes that inspire dialogue and social activism. Hashtag the Flutist Activist initiative has so far resulted in three pieces, one for flute and mixed media by Leanna Keith based on gun violence in the USA, a work for piccolo and piano inspired by the global warming crisis by Herman Beeftink, and C10H15N for piccolo and piano by Linthicum Black Horse, a theatrical work paraphrasing the drug epidemic in America. Beard also founded the International Piccolo Symposium, an intense four-day workshop held at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, where she teaches flute and piccolo, chamber music, and contemporary music literature. In addition to performing, Beard's research interests include music by exiled, banned, censored, and persecuted composers, as well as the role of music during the Holocaust and music composed for flute by victims of the Holocaust. Christy Beard, welcome to Music Crush. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited. Thanks for coming. It is one of the great pleasures of my middle age life that after knowing of you in the field for so long, we've become friends. Me as well. I I just love the time that we've spent together, even though it's been very limited, but hopefully that will change in the future. Do you remember how we met? I was just thinking about this. I'm sure it was probably at an NFA convention, but I, I don't remember the actual moment. I was foist upon you at your school because my trio, which was very active at that time, was in town for a chamber series that your lovely colleague, Stacey Hainline, runs. And so I had found her in Chamber Music America, listed in Chamber Music America, is running, running a chamber music series. So I reached out to her and did all of the planning with her. And this happened quite a few times in the in the couple of years that my trio was most active, that one, one or the other of us would book a gig. Well, it was either me or the saxophonist. The pianist was was very clear that we were just happy to have her. But either either Scott or I would book a gig and then, you know, that would be the only connection. And then everybody else would just kind of get stuck doing something with us. And many times when I was not in touch with the flute teacher ahead of time, nobody was ever impolite. But sometimes I'd end up at a school and the teacher was very hands off because that person hadn't picked me and didn't didn't really want to be stuck with me as a guest. You showed up right away as we got there and vacated your office, made some other plans. I'd ne- I'd never spoken to you before. I had heard you at NFA before, but we'd never spoken. Made plans to teach lessons elsewhere, gave me the use of your office, logged out of your computer and logged me in in case I wanted to do email. You know, you were so generous and so warm and welcoming. And we went out after the concert that night. And it was like, it was like we'd known each other for decades, even though we just met. And I just, that always sticks out to me so much because... I feel like you are one of the people in our in our flute world that that helps make things nicer. That's so sweet. I I do remember you coming to our campus. I did not remember that that was the first time that we had met. I probably knew of you, um, and I don't remember anything that you just said about you know me vacating my office and all. That. But that sounds like something I would do because I I love to have guest artists at my school and working with my students and I was thrilled to have you there. So I'm glad that that was a a great experience. It was a great experience for my students too. And I I remember us enjoying our time together while you were there. Yeah. Your, your generosity really stuck out in, in a sea of many very kind flute players that we all know. Absolutely. I feel like 
the work that you're doing as a performer, you know, feeds into this as well. I mean, this is this is certainly not separate from the way I see you as a whole. Let's talk about some of the stuff you've been doing recently in in your performances. At the time of this recording, you just returned from NFA a couple of weeks ago and you performed some some pretty heavy stuff based on your research and your advocacy interests. And you've been doing that in other places too. I'm curious how NFA as a venue was for those performances. How was that received? And was that any different from your Omaha performances? Yeah, it's kind of funny that you asked that because I went into this particular NFA a little guarded and a little concerned about how some of the performances would be taken by that audience, specifically with uh, Lithicum Black Horse's new commission um, C10H15N, which is the chemical formula for methamphetamines. It's a very deep and I don't know what the word is that I want. Just intense piece. I can I can tell the story without giving anything away because he shares this in his program notes. But when I had reached out to him to set up this commission a little under a year ago now, when we set up the Zoom interview, just a few days before the Zoom interview, he had been in a bar in Lubbock, Texas, and unbeknownst to him had been slipped some drugs in his drink that he'd left at the bar. And fortunately or unfortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, he finished the beer rather quickly and went home and then was left at his apartment by himself to deal with the aftermath of this this drug dose that he didn't know had happened. And um, so when he called me for the Zoom interview a couple minutes or a couple days later, he was still riding that intense uh, wave of, of high and kind of manic reaction to it. And we, we hadn't decided on a topic for the commission yet at that time, because um, that was part of the reason for the Zoom meeting. And while he was telling me the story about what had happened to him, he was, you know, alluding to, you know, maybe I should write the piece about this experience. And, you know, this is such a huge issue, not, not only across America, but especially on the tribes, on um, the reservations for Lakota Nation people. And but he wasn't sure that that was where he wanted to go, um, because obviously it was still very raw and fresh and he was very emotional from the experience that he was still going through. But then after we, you know, started talking about it and he started coming up with these ideas just off the cuff, it sounded more and more amazing in a sad, you know, way, obviously, because I'm, I'm really sad that he had to go through this experience. But the piece ends up being kind of a dramatic work. It's got some beautiful moments, which was the main reason that I had reached out to William to write a piece for Piccolo is that, you know, based on his other works, especially if you think about his Sounds of Water for flute and piano, it's got such beautiful harmony and melody. And so I was thinking of that when I asked him to write this piece. And so it does have some moments of some beauty, but it's juxtaposed against these manic cravings that the piccoloist has like right off the bat of the performance you're supposed to pretend to get high before you even start um, so in the score he has these symbols um, little poison symbols in the music every time he wants the piccoloist to interrupt the music and go take a hit which of course upsets the pianist so the pianist is very much a part of the the drama of this as well yeah, so it's intense and you have to, you know, I spent months thinking about how I was going to re relive or not relive because I haven't lived that, but live in a person's shoes who is addicted to some type of a drug or substance and the effect that that would have on your body and on your mind and um, your ability to concentrate and to, you know, to get through a performance. Um, and it just keeps getting more intense and more intense through the uh, movements until finally in the third movement, it starts off with the pianist slamming the cover of the keys down and leaving the stage in disgust because she can't put up with the piccolo player anymore. And that's what usually happens in real life with somebody who is addicted to drugs and especially with something like meth, where the statistics is something like 90% of users end up dying. And there's really 
very little path to recovery for those people and most of them end up dying. So the piece is supposed to represent that you end up alienating yourself and end up alone. And in talking to William about it, as I was going through how I was going to act this out, I decided that for the last movement, I would fall down to the ground and eventually prop myself up against the leg of the piano and play the third movement from that position. And initially the last movement, he had is kind of beautiful, long notes that are held. And I said, I think it sounds too controlled. How do you feel about me just doing random pitch bends everywhere? Like, you know, you're starting to just lose control of yourself. And so we ended up injecting that into the performance of the last movement. And I think it absolutely was the right call. Yeah, so it was a very intense, dramatic piece. And I was concerned because you don't see those types of works performed at NFA. You know, I kept envisioning, I I had actually joked with uh, Lisa Bost when we were together this summer about, you know, please don't kick me out of the NFA for for doing this piece. I was genuinely concerned. I didn't think they were going to kick me out, but I I genuinely felt like I was going to get some pushback. Like, this is not the type of piece that we want, you know, to be performed here. But it was a full house. It was at the end of a program that was devoted to new compositions. And after a few moments of silence, after I finished and I broke the action, so to speak, there was long applause and eventually a standing ovation and people came up in tears after the performance to tell me how moved they were either because they, you know, knew somebody that had, you know, been a victim of drug abuse or substance abuse of some kind, or, you know, it was, it was a a very emotional experience. And I was, happy that it touched people in the in the right way was the composer able to attend he was he he was there he set up his whole recording equipment to catch the whole thing on video and edit it and put it up on youtube so if you you missed it you can see it there although he did edit out the physical actions of me pretending to do drugs because youtube would apparently not show the video if that was depicted um, so you don't get the full effect, but it, every time I leave the camera, that's what I'm doing. So, wow, it was powdered sugar, by the way. <laughs> you you made you helped make a too racy piccolo and piano piece too racy for you too. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. I mean, since you mentioned NFA, I mean, I think that was the first time I heard you. I I think I remember. First hearing you at NFA doing something very traditional, like I think it was the Damas trio with oboe and piano, actually. And then a few years later, I started seeing your name more and more attached to piccolo work, championing the piccolo and commissioning lots of great music for piccolo. Oh, I see your name involved with a lot of music festivals for both flute and piccolo. And now you have most recently added this advocacy kind of social justice work to your credits. So over the course of a career, it looks like there is this more and more specific evolution that occurs, for lack of a better word. How do you pick your your projects? It's interesting. Yeah, so the first, I do remember performing that uh, Damas trio for Flute Nobo that was with uh, Michelle Vigneault, who teaches at the University of Memphis, and she was one of my best friends in grad school, and um, we had a trio that um, we were trying to, at least the two of us, keep intact after we both graduated and went to different institutions, and just as, just as an aside, the name of that trio was, humorously, we called ourselves the Decline Trio, D-E and then L-E-I-N, because the three of us were really good friends, and we'd get into rehearsal and start talking and yapping and having a good time, and the rehearsal would just decline. I mean, but we, we got things done, obviously. We had a good time. You know, I actually started focusing on piccolo in my undergrad. Funny enough, my undergraduate teacher, Joe Bonner, heard me playing piccolo in a practice room because we all had to march piccolos in the marching band. Mm -hmm. And he thought I sounded really good on piccolo and encouraged me to take the audition for what was then known as the Northeast Arkansas Symphony. It's now known as the Delta Symphony. And I'd never taken an orchestra audition before. So he handed me the excerpts and I learned them and went into the audition and I won the spot. Joe 
was not a piccolo player. He didn't know anything about piccolo, but he was very happy to, you know, let me go down that path and perform music on piccolo. So I got my kind of like cut my teeth with him on piccolo music. And well, actually it was all arrangements of piccolo because he didn't know any piccolo music. And then I remember that audition specifically that I had to play Polovitzian dances at the end of the audition and I was terrified and I just closed my eyes and played it <laughs> and the monitor came out from behind the screen afterwards and just handed me the folder and said there you go so that, that was my first piccolo audition I continued piccolo emphasis through college um, through graduate school and again my my teacher Fritz Kraber at University of Texas was not a piccolo player um, nor did he teach piccolo but he was happy to have me come in with piccolo music. And so one of the first big pieces that I learned was the Lieberman Concerto for piccolo and performed that on one of my doctoral recitals. And then soon after that, the Texas Flute Society held one of their festivals in the summer of 2000. And Zart Eby of the Seattle Symphony was one of the guest artists or the guest artists, I don't remember. And um, that was the first time that I ever actually heard a real piccolo soloist. And I was just mesmerized and I knew I had to go take some lessons with her. So I asked her afterwards if I could come to Seattle and take some lessons, which I did. I think it was maybe in the fall of 2000. And um, I brought the Lieberman. And so we had two days. I worked on uh, Lieberman of Vivaldi, the first lesson. And then the second day I showed back up at her house and I was warming up. And she said, you know, I've heard you play piccolo. You sound great, but I heard you warming up on flute. Let's, let's have a flute lesson. <laughs> so we had a flute lesson that second day, which was really awesome. She had heard some things in my flute playing that just still needed a little tweaking. And that was kind of the, the story of my life is that piccolo playing always came easier for me than flute. I had to struggle and work to make my flute playing at the same level as my piccolo playing my entire life. Um, so I have always been a piccolo player and I really focused on that throughout most of my career. I was trying to, like I said, bring my flute playing up to the same level, but it wasn't very often that I felt comfortable in venues like the NFA playing flute unless it was in a chamber situation. So it was probably, I'd say 10 years or so into my professional career, if you want to call it that, before I got comfortable actually playing solo flute at a convention. Piccolo was the main focus that I had throughout most of my career, but then I started worrying about also just getting pegged as a piccolo player and not being taken seriously as a flutist. And I sent my resume back to a couple of my mentors from the University of Texas um, because I was starting to get some pushback like that, like, oh, you're just a piccolo player. And so they helped me tweak my CV in ways to kind of lessen the, the visual of being so piccolo focused and being able to, I don't want to say minimize, but to bring out more of the flute things and put less stress on the piccolo. Piccolo commissioning became important to me because the uh, repertoire was still very lacking. So that was something that was at the forefront of my efforts from a very early age. And then really projects from that point always just kind of came up because of circumstance. You know, for instance, with, you know, quite candidly, the political climate before the pandemic had me really upset and I was glued to the television constantly and watching the news and I started to become very politically active, which I had never been in my life. I was taking part in marches and demonstrations and protests here in Omaha and giving to political causes and, and that sort of thing. And um, that is kind of what instigated me to start my Flutist Activist Initiative project, which still is a project to commission composers to to write works inspired or influenced by social, environmental, and political injustice issues. And so I was in the middle of that project and through that work started getting interested in researching band and censored composers just to kind of see, you know, throughout history, what were some of the reasons that musicians were 
uh, influenced by politics or, you know, happenings in the world and how that influenced their music and how that perhaps got them exiled or banned. And then the pandemic hit. And of course, that threw everybody, you know, for a huge loop. And emotionally, it was very trying for all of us in different ways. And I suddenly found myself unable to find joy in practicing my piccolo music. Um, I still love the piccolo. I love the sound of the piccolo, but I just couldn't play through any of the music that I currently had in my, in my repertoire. And I had to ask myself, you know, why is this the case? And I decided that it was because regardless of the past 20 years of work that so many piccolo players have done in championing the piccolo and increasing the repertoire that there's still a lack of repertoire for the piccolo that says anything that is emotionally deep and beautiful and you know gripping and so i found myself going back to flute works and that's what kind of drove the next stage of my projects was you know thinking okay i need to find music that says something that means something that they're you know it's not just music for beauty's sake or music for music's sake but something that has an importance to it and then you know going from there i got hooked up with the samuel bach museum which is on our campus here at uno samuel bach was a or is he's still living in his 90s he is a holocaust survivor artist who lives, I believe in New York, it might be New Jersey, but he's up there in the Northeast. And he made some kind of connection with Omaha about 10 years ago. I remember the the opening reception of the, the gallery exhibit that he had at our school. And I just happened to be there and he donated hundreds of his paintings to UNO to open up a gallery here in Omaha. And I got tied in with the Bach Museum when their curator, Alex, wrote to the music school and asked if anybody was interested in working on a joint music lecture and art series. And I was the only one of our faculty that responded. So I, I know it's, it's so strange that these opportunities come up, but I, I jumped at it because I thought this is going to be really interesting. So I helped to curate an entire uh, music series with Alex, with this lecture series that she already had going on, and I got my students involved. I had each of them performing either works by Jewish composers or composers that were somehow impacted by the Holocaust or works that somehow spoke to some of the artwork that was in the exhibit. So it's just been, you know, this kind of continuous wave of circumstances that, you know, a door opens and I step in and let's go this direction or let's go that direction, you know, depending on what the, what the uh, environment has has uh, given me at that time. And so that's that's pretty much how I've picked my projects um, aside from focusing on the piccolo. And that might seem really haphazard, but I, I also think that it's important to allow those doors to just open in front of you and see where they take you. And it's been really fascinating for me. You're not the first person in in our recent conversations to say that around the pandemic or after 2016, it felt like the work needed to be more serious or that it, there there was a, a greater sense of urgency to say something. Do you do you foresee anything new on the horizon right now or are you going to live in the flutist activist project for a while longer, you think? Um, I definitely feel like there's still a lot of work to be done with the Flutist Activist Initiative. I don't see myself stopping to commission composers for pieces that are meaningful and that, you know, have some tie to current events and things that impact our daily lives, or even things that maybe you don't think impact your daily life, but, you know, that are important to have a focus put on them. You know, I mean, as far as New projects go, um, the emphasis on music that was composed by composers impacted by the Holocaust is the the newest 
tangent, if, if you will, of that Flutus Activist project. And I've spent the last basically 12 months uh, researching those works and specifically for flute. I always feel bad when I find out about a composer and then I go and look at their works list and they don't have any flute music. And so they don't make it onto my list, but that's, you know, the, the point of my project is to discover pieces for flute or with flute. Um, and there's been other research by other musicians and scholars for orchestral works and for string music and piano music. And very little has been done in the realm of flute music outside of the Netherlands. And so I think there's still a lot of research to be done in that regard. And um, actually, I would love and I'm in the process of putting together a Fulbright application to be able to go to some of the countries in Europe, like the Czech Republic and Latvia and other places where there seems to have been some musical activity that hasn't been deeply researched in this realm. So, you know, fingers crossed, maybe that will happen in the next couple of years. Well, speaking a little bit more in the immediate, uh, you are hosting the New Music Festival with FNMC in October. And part of that, you're going to give the festival premiere of Rena Esmail's Pathways of Desire. We wanted to check in and see how that's going. If you had any first impressions, any tips, or just any overall reactions. Yeah, you know, um, to be to be completely honest, I looked at it um, right after I got the music from you guys and kind of read through it slowly to just kind of get a feel of what the piece was going to be like. And um, then I had to put it away because I had a bunch of music for NFA that I needed to finish putting together. Um, and then I just brought up the uh, pathways again this week after I came home from convention. And, you know, what I love about the piece is that she really gives the performer the freedom to make a lot of musical choices and decisions in phrasing and um, just how they want to be expressive in the piece. Um, But that's also the challenge of the work as well, you know, because there's so much freedom to uh, to be able to play it in any way that you see fit that I think it's one of those pieces that really takes really requires for the performer to be musically mature or at the very least to be working with a teacher who can really help guide the player you know to making those decisions and making it still sound organic. As far as any tips, I mean, you know, again I'm just kind of getting into the details of the work, but there are places in especially I think the first and second movement I should have brought it in front of me to look at it, but um, the first and second movement I think where she has a lot of pitch slides that are um, indicated and Some of them are rather large intervallic slides that are difficult or impossible to do from the given note. Having said that, I've been experimenting with a lot of different fake fingerings to try to figure out how to make those pitch slides even uh, more successful. And I've come up with some ways to make those work the way that she's notated them. Um, So I'll be happy to share those fingerings that I have come up with for some of those pitch slides to to help to facilitate those for other flutists. We've gotten to know a a little bit of the work that some of your current and former students have done because they have also written and been programmed in in some really interesting ways on this festival that's happening at your school in October. I can see the way you have fostered their their own personal projects and interests in unique ways so that, you know, their proposals looked individualistic, not just another flute player, right? You've been teaching for decades I'm wondering what you, what's your pedagogical philosophy? What do you feel your responsibility is to them and and how might contemporary music fit into that? That's a great question. And I'm I'm going to uh, not read my official teaching philosophy for this one that, you know, that you have to write for various things. But, you know, I mean, first and foremost, you know, obviously we are flute teachers and I want to train my students to be the best musicians possible, um, regardless of what level they enter university, 
um, you know, having solid fundamentals and just being the best musicians that they possibly can be, whether they're going to be teachers or performers or just being, you know, involved in music um, as a way of expressing themselves for the rest of their lives, even if it's not their full-time job. But aside from that, I am not the type of teacher that can be completely removed from the person behind the instrument. I, I feel like whether we like it or not, we are mentors. We are role models to the students that come under our charge. And I try as much as I can to be the best role model that I can be. Doesn't mean that I'm perfect. I own up to my mistakes and I'm very candid with my students about mistakes that I have made in my past, mostly to help them from making those same mistakes. You know, but I, I want them to be more than anything good human beings and be able to contribute to society in a way that they will feel good about themselves in the future and, and now um, to find their own voices. Like you said, I, I, I definitely don't try to put out, you know, many car carbon copies of myself, either as players or as people. I very much want my students to be the best version of themselves and try to help them find their voice through their own interests and projects that they you know, think are important to them and figure out a way to uh, bring those projects to light, to fruition and incorporate it into their whole musical and educational journey when they're at UNO. Um, I just recently saw a post online from somebody on Facebook who said something about, you've done your job as a teacher if your students have no idea of your political affiliation or your yeah, personal beliefs and a political affiliation. And I saw the post and it kind of, you know, it stuck with me because I thought I get what they're saying that we're not supposed to use our roles as teachers to brainwash our students into thinking a certain way or believing a certain thing. But I do think it's important for us to show our own convictions and give students the opportunity to learn and choose, you know, what their own convictions are. I want my students to understand, you know, why I make the choices that I make. And I never force them to uh, be involved in projects that they have conflicts with, um, that they don't believe in, that they, you know, whether it's because um, maybe we're doing a Christmas, you know, Christmas concert and I have somebody in the group that is not religious and doesn't want to be involved in that. I'm not going to force them to do that, just like I'm not going to force somebody to play music by, you know, a particular composer if they feel like that composer politically or socially disagrees with their philosophy. Um, but I, I do think it's important that we educate students from all walks of life and let them make their own decisions, you know, based on everything around them. You know, we can't shield them from different ideas. We need to make sure that they understand all the parameters. One of the things we love to ask our guests is if you lived in a world with no limits, what are some of the projects you would love to get involved in? Limits for me is like budget. You know, sure. we, we... I mean, well, yeah. And in a world where you don't have to worry about budget or like locations, not an issue. Basically there are no parameters. If you could plunk, create a dream project, what do you think you'd get into? Yeah, I have a couple actually. Um, you know, I started the international uh, piccolo symposium many, many years ago, and we had three successful festivals. And then after that, um, a couple of piccoloists in Europe kind of took up the charge. And I've been happy to let that, you know, go to them. Uh, Nic Nicola Mazzanti is amazing. And his International Piccolo Festival, which I'm, I'm very proud to say was inspired by the uh, International Piccolo Symposium that I had here, um, I'm happy that he is is doing that. Um, I would love to revive the Piccolo Symposium here, but with a focus on Piccolo composition as opposed to pedagogy, and do more with commissioning composers um, to write 
specifically for Piccolo for that festival and having those pieces performed at the festival, just anything to do with Piccolo composition. The second thing that, and this is actually probably more on the horizon than the Piccolo Symposium, simply because this is kind of where my heart is right now, is with all of this focus on music activism and the Flutus Activism Project, Flutus Activist Project, I really would love to create some type of a festival of music activism. I just think it would be really amazing to gather performers and scholars and artists from all around the world to discuss, perform, to uh, do lectures and panel discussions or, you know, whatever on the history of political activism and music and the ways that artists and composers, musicians and scholars can continue to use their platforms to affect change in today's society. I just, I just think that would be really fascinating. And I don't know of any festivals that specifically focus on that type of music uh, or music activism right now. So that's kind of where my, my brain is taking me. And then the last thing I'll say, which you'll, you'll probably laugh at, but I think maybe a lot of us have thought about these types of things as well, but I have a, a really wonderful group of, of close flute friends, especially Christopher Lee, as you know, one of my best friends and Sergio Palatelli. And we uh, joke all the time about retiring to some place near water on the ocean and having like a flute commune, just, just living there and teaching and, and playing, maybe not teaching, just playing (laughs) and taking care of each other and having music in our lives. And uh, yeah, that would be a dream. You should talk to Michael Janice about an activist bent to a a festival. I feel like the two of you could be a dream team. That's actually a really good I was actually thinking you should chat with the folks that run the New Music Gathering. When I was there two years ago, the the direct theme of the festival was not activism, but it was present in more places than it was not. And Michael Janice was also there and extremely involved. So it seems like there's a a little thread there for you to pull if that's Mm -hmm. something you are. Cool. Yeah, I just became aware of that um, organization just within the past several months. So I they're definitely on my radar. But yeah, thank you for mentioning that. And I'll definitely look at that. Awesome. I look forward to hearing where that goes. Yeah. Yay. Well, hopefully you'll both be involved when it happens. Last favorite question. Can you name three pieces of music you're enjoying right now? Oh, gosh. In my research of banned and censored exiled composers, I ran across this composer from from Czechoslovakia named Jan Novak, who wrote a really great piece for Piccolo called Marcius. Um, And I played a couple movements of it um, on my lecture recital at the NFA having to do with exiled composers. Um, I'm really enjoying that piece because it's just such a fun work for the piccolo. It has a lot of Martineau vibes in it because he was a student of Martineau and I love Martineau's work. So it definitely has a lot of that sound in it. I have been uh, really interested in working on music for flute and electronics recently. It was something that I had steered away from for a very long time because uh, me and technology are not very friendly. And um, every time I try to do something with any kind of technology, something goes wrong. And um, the idea of traveling with technology always really just scared me. But um, the more that I do it, the more I love it. And um, so one of the pieces that I'm really having fun with right now is um, even though I'm not actually working on it, um, one of my students is learning it for the uh, FNMC Festival 50 Fish. Nice. Yeah. That is just such a good piece. And it's it's got really cool effects and um, it's just it's just fun to work on. So I'm, I'm having fun working on it through my student right now, um, Noah, who's going to be playing it. And then the third one, I mean, I'm enjoying working on the pieces that I'm playing for this, uh, for a couple of upcoming Holocaust lecture recitals that I'm doing. Um, I'm doing a program at the Illinois Holocaust Museum in a couple of weeks. And the Schulhoff flute sonata it's great. was not on my radar before. And it's really, really nice. Um, so I, I am enjoying working on that. Yeah, I mean, as far as as ear candy, I am a heavy metal junkie. So if I get 
into a mood where I just don't want to listen to flute music anymore. I turn on my 80s hair band music and rock out to Def Leppard and Black Sabbath. Do you have do you have one song? Well, what's what's a Def Leppard song that comes to mind right now that's always a go-to for you? Oh, Pour Some Sugar on Me. Okay. All right. Yeah, Pour Some Sugar on Me or Guns N' Roses. You know, just anything that's just kind of loud and obnoxious. Welcome to the Jungle. <laughs> Which I learned, you know, actually that piece, Welcome to the Jungle, he actually had somebody yell that phrase to him. I forget where he was at. It was like maybe in some kind of bad section of Los Angeles and he got out of the car and somebody said, Welcome to the Jungle, you're going to die. And that was the impotence for that piece. <laughs> Did you Do you know that Nicole Chamberlain has a flute choir um, version of, is it Enter Sandman? It is. It's a Metallica tune. I've always, my dream is to do that with my studio. It, it's probably finally coming in the next couple of years, but it's, it's, you know, it's a work in progress getting them ready to do it. But, you know, I hadn't thought about it, but we're doing a concert this fall on, um, it's all like mythological and um, legend pieces, oh, like myths and legends. So I probably could wrap in Sandman into that idea. Hmm. I may have we to did think it about last fall. It was super fun. I will warn you, it's not on her website. It's only available on Sheet Music Plus, but okay. it's a good time. Oh, fun stuff. Well, Christy Beard, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for asking me. I really appreciate it. And I'm just happy, so happy to be part of the FNMC organization. You guys are doing such great things and I'm looking forward to what's next. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Music Crush. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also support the podcast, read show notes, and learn more about FNMC by visiting www.flutenewmusicconsortium.com.